My name is Franklin, and I'm an atheist. How would you know at all if you're being accurate? I've read a lot about religion. What exactly does through Jesus Christ mean? What is it about their religion that resonates with who they are? If not an anthropomorphic being, is there an enemy? How does their religion make them a better person? Can you explain uh, to me and anybody who doesn't know what a mitzvah is? What do they think is missing about how we understand the world? What would be the difference between praying on a subject and just thinking on a subject? Why don't people have superpowers anymore? I think it's important to talk to them and find out what they believe. Does Rabbi Joseph Kolakowski belong in prison? I'd say yes. He works there. He's a prison chaplain with the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. Hello and welcome to the What They Believe series. Today my guest is Rabbi Joseph Kolakowski, who is a Hasidic rabbi in Pennsylvania. Thanks again to those who are helping out on Patreon. The links are here and down below in the thingy. Once again, the questions are marked out on the YouTube timeline, so if there's a question in which you have a particular interest, feel free to skip ahead. I hope you enjoy the interview, and make sure you stick around for the end when I talk about two things you probably didn't know. Hello and welcome to the What They Believe series. Today my guest is Rabbi Joseph Kolakowski. Thank you for joining us, Rabbi. Thank you, Franklin, for having me. I appreciate it. I've spoken to several Jewish leaders on this series, uh, two rabbis and a cantor so far. With which version of Judaism do you identify? Kind of from our perspective, the way I look at it, it is it is the original rabbinical Judaism. But if you want a pigeonhole, more or less, I'm, I certainly would be in the Orthodox world. And then among the Orthodox, if you want to take that phylogeny a little bit further, then there's you know, today there's modern orthodoxy and ultra orthodoxy. And then there are other groups that kind of within that kind of broke off earlier. So I would kind of fit in somewhere in a sense that would be a Hungarian style of Hasidic ultra orthodoxy, but with some personal kind of liberalism, which isn't really that contradictory to that uh, as well. I, and uh, I'm saying having a religious worldview that's maybe a little bit more pluralistic in a pragmatic sense as opposed to in a theological sense. Were you born into Hasidic Judaism? I was not born into Hasidic Judaism and I was raised in a home where my mother is Jewish, my father was Roman Catholic and went to church fairly regularly, went to Catholic school. My exposure to Judaism, to religion in general, would have been more toward Orthodox Judaism than anything. I had my circumcision in a Orthodox synagogue. I had my bar mitzvah in Orthodox synagogue, although I was also baptized in the Catholic Church, but I was never confirmed. I didn't really ever go to church other than a funeral or, or when my sisters were baptized, something like that, as opposed to going to synagogue was something that was much more regular. So I, I've been within the Orthodox world for about 25 years. In reading the Old Testament or Torah or Pentateuch, I noticed that Satan is never mentioned. Uh, I recognize that some say the serpent in the garden was Satan, but I don't see any evidence for that in the rest of the book. What is the view on Satan in Judaism? Well, first of all, the term Old Testament is a Christian term. Um, I might prefer the term Hebrew Bible. A lot of people like the term Tanakh which includes more than just the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books, as you know, of both the Christian and Jewish Bible. But then when you have the other books, the books that the Protestants would have in their Old Testament are basically the Jewish, the Hebrew Bible. Um, we don't call it old because we consider it to be current, whereas the Christianity believes that the New Testament superseded the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. But the main covenant, you're correct, is the Pentateuch, but the other books are the prophets and the hagiographic writings like the Psalms. Those books do have references to an angel called Hasatan, the Satan, uh, always referred to when being referred to in that sense uh, as a particular being uh, with the particular article of ha or the, meaning it's not as much of a name as perhaps a title. And that word Satan does appear in the Pentateuch. One example would be Numbers chapter 22, verse 22, where it's talking about an angel who was being presented to a wicked 
or at least from our perspective, a wicked sorcerer coming from the Midianites to curse the Israelites, uh, unbeknownst to them, uh, all the all the while. And he's riding his donkey, and an angel comes with a sword in front of him. And the Hebrew text there says that uh, uses the word Satan as a verb. That the angel is there, le Satan lo, in order to be an adversary against. However, the interesting thing with that, classical commentator to the Jewish Bible and the Talmud would be Rashi, Rabbi Solomon Isaacides, who lived in France uh, about a thousand years ago and is considered to be very authoritative in, in the Jewish world. He said that that was an angel of mercy because he was trying to prevent this, uh, this sorcerer Balaam, we call Bilam, from going and doing this evil deed. That's an interesting uh, take on it because that, that view, when we get to the idea of an actual being called Hasatan, which we do find elsewhere in scripture, probably most famously would be the book of Job. Uh, there's another reference in the book of Zechariah um, to, uh, I, I believe it's Zechariah 3, where uh, a, a figure called Hasatan, the Satan, the adversary, is being cursed or damned by God um, and rebuked. Solomon is writing uh, a letter to his friend, King Hiram, and uh, talking about his desire to build a temple, something that, uh, that Solomon's father, King David, was unable to do. And Solomon said that there is no adversary or bad occurrence preventing me from building the temple. And that word for adversary or a, a uh, impediment could be another uh, obstacle could be another was also satan so that would be what satan would be viewed as the view of the the satan in the way that the rabbis presented and the way that he's presented in the book of job as well as in zechariah is one of more or less an angel who is subservient to god but perhaps is an enemy of man uh, and like I said, the word is adversary, but also he's presented more or less as a prosecuting attorney, which working in prison chaplaincy when people, this is a very popular question, you know, how does Judaism view the devil, Satan? And when I tell them, I said, it's easy for you guys to understand for me to say that a prosecuting attorney is the devil. But in a sense, the prosecuting attorney we know is doing a service to society by accusing people of crimes and making sure that they receive the punishments that they deserve for those crimes. Although there are different mythologies within the Jewish traditions as to whether there is just one angel who has this title of Hasatan, or that title can be used for different angels and whatever that particular mission that they're being sent on from God to do at that time, they have that title, just like a prosecutor is not always the same lawyer, but a different lawyer will be you know, appointed by the state or by the county as a prosecutor in a civil or criminal uh, setting. Uh, the, the same thing, it's not clear, like we mentioned, that that angel, who was an angel of mercy, was being sent to be a Satan against Balaam because he was doing something evil. And so he was an, ob a, an obstacle to this evil man, but he was acting to make a, a, a whole circle back on this to the beginning, that he was acting as an, a, an adversary and an obstacle performing an act of mercy. A big part of Judaism's history is the loss of the temple. The first temple was built and then lost, and the second temple was built and then lost. In your opinion, should Jewish people pursue a third temple? It's not really even just a question of my own opinion, but in Orthodox Judaism, there is a central idea that we're looking forward to the restoration of and, and the building of the third temple and that the ter third temple would be the ideal temple that would be greater than the first or second ever were. Uh, however, the question would be, since you asked very specifically, and I appreciate the specific nature of that question as to whether or not this should be pursued, the question is, how do we pursue it? And the traditional view um, ha has also been a matter of debate. I practice a Hungarian version of Hasidic Judaism, ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Judaism, traditionalist view about eschatology. 
that it has to be something that is totally wrought by God and cannot be pursued by any human means, as opposed to the modern Orthodox world, which are more worldly, more participatory in the world, but their view of eschatology is that something that we as human beings have to actualize because God helps those that help themselves. The modern Orthodox world embraced the secular movement of Zionism as being a part of that eschatological movement, and that eventually the state of Israel would transform through the physical means that they created the state, that the secularists created the state, would somehow uh, be a step toward the, esca- the realization of eschatology, the building of the temple, the gathering the exiles, and the coming of the Messiah. The, the Hungarian view, which is a more an older view, a more traditional view, was that just the opposite. In fact, you asked about the Satan. So Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum was probably the greatest leader of Hungarian Jewry and well-respected throughout Orthodox Jewry. Creation of the modern state of Israel was what he called Mase Satan. Uh, Mase Satan means uh, a, a satanic act. It could be translated as an act of Satan. And I, I remember getting some pushback of that. Uh, you know, is he saying, therefore, that the Satan is an independent being that uh, can rebel against God by creating the state that God doesn't want? Or, But my answer to that would be, no, just the, the opposite. We see book of Deuteronomy chapter 13, that it says that God could send a false prophet to test us, to see, are we going to be impressed by signs and portents, or are we going to keep our faith in the traditional manner? And so too, even if uh, things that uh, six day war and things like that seem to be manifestations of some kind of miraculous divine will, that doesn't necessarily point to the fact that that's what we're supposed to follow. It could rather be a test from God to see, are we going to be impressed by this apparent miracle? Or are we going to stay to our old traditions? Although then he would also answer that, you know, even the, the secular uh, you know, scholars of war uh, predicted, you know, the, I think people in the, uh, uh, the Johnson administration at that time, 1967, said that if the Arabs would attack Israel, uh, they would the is, Israel would beat all the Arab nations back in about a week, and that's what happened. And, and they, they weren't saying that as a miraculous issue. That was just a matter of fact of the their military capabilities, uh, meaning that it's a, a test from God to see are are we going to follow our traditions, which says to wait for the coming of a Messiah, which we believe would be just a normal human. We don't believe to be the way the Christians believe their Messiah is a son of God, but nonetheless. Are we going to wait for that, or are we going to take matters into our own hands? I've seen this written different ways, but I couldn't find a biblical reference. Can you tell me about the prayer that starts with, thank God I'm not a woman or a Gentile? Uh, if you want a biblical reference, not from not from our Bible, but in the Christian Bible, there is a story, I, I believe it's presented as a parable, where Jesus mentions that there is a Pharisee who stands in the front, I, I don't remember if it was a temple or a synagogue, which are two different things, um, uh, which I know you know that, but I don't know if all the viewers know that. There's a, a man, he's identified as a Pharisee, and he says, thank you, God, for not making me like other men. And in the back, there's the, uh, I believe, a tax collector, and he says, you know, forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. Uh, in that parable, you know, Jesus is saying, obviously, that God favors more the tax collector in the back of the temple who is humble as opposed to the arrogant Pharisee standing in the front. Now, while we might have many, many disagreements with Christianity and with the records that they claim in their, what they call their New Testament and other things, uh, that story to me resonates as, as a, a proper story and the same type of story that our rabbis would tell. I, I believe that it is making a reference to that part of our liturgy. And so, and so to there are a series of blessings that are recited before the morning liturgy that are recited every day for the things that we're thankful for each day. Part of that is, uh, and the liturgy has to be expressed verbally. Even if it's in a whisper, there has to be the movement of lips because Judaism is very much concerned about action, and but words are actions because of the movement of the lips, the rabbis say, is an action. And so therefore, the, to recite prayer, I remember in your introduction, you asked, what's the difference between praying on something and thinking on something? 
it's not because God needs to know, we're not giving him any information, but rather we're really conditioning ourselves to believe certain things and to express our faith and to feel connection. And we're told to speak to God verbally, to even if it's a whisper. And when it comes to these particular uh, benedictions that we recite in the morning, uh, you know, we thank God that we able to open our eyes, that we have clothes, we have shoes, we have, you know, things like that. Uh, so three of them are like this. One is, thank you, you know, all the blessings start, blessed art thou, O Lord, which is from Psalm 119, and then it continues, our, uh, our God, the king of the universe, that's the formula the blessings begin with. The one says, Shalom Asani Goy, that I was not, that you had not made me a Gentile. And then the next one, Shalom Asani Aved, that you had not made me a slave. And then men say, the third one, Shalom Asani Isha, that you had not made me a woman. And the Talmud doesn't say exactly why, but then we have many commentaries upon commentaries that explain this. And it's noted that these have to be recited specifically in that order because it's a, a descending order of responsibilities. Meaning the way that the Jewish people view the world is that God made a covenant first with Adam and then with Noah. The amount of responsibilities that a Jew has of being part of the Mosaic covenant is more than the responsibilities that a Gentile has to being in the Noahide covenant. So it's not a matter of looking down on Gentiles the way that it's presented in that story um, that Jesus tells about the Pharisee being arrogant over other people. And that might have been how he read that liturgy. That might have been how that man understood that liturgy. And perhaps that was wrong. But, the, uh, but rather, the way that our commentators look at it is that we're thankful for the responsibilities that we have being under the Mosaic covenant as opposed to being under the, the Noahide covenant. Uh, the next level then is the slave, uh, a Canaanite slave in ancient times, meaning it was halfway toward conversion to Judaism. In, in the Hebrew tradition, it was taught that if you take a slave upon yourself, you're taking a master upon yourself and you have certain obligations to the slave. Then if you only have one pillow, you have to give it to the slave. If you only have one piece of food, you have to give it to the slave first before you can eat because you have obligations to take care of this person who is you know really part of your family now with those obligations those opportunities to connect to god through these obligations through uh that we are not slaves and then the next level is uh, a man would say having not made me a woman again not to be misogynistic against women the talmud has tremendous respect for women and, and instructs just similar to how in the Christian Bible, they say that a uh, man should love his wife like Christ loved the church, Paul writes. So uh, in the Jewish Talmud, it says that a man should respect his wife more than he respects himself and give her more than he gives himself, adorn her and, and give her more luxuries than he himself enjoys. And so there is respect for women and also there's opportunities given to women to emancipate themselves, but nonetheless, they do not have obligations that men have. So basically what we're told is that any time bound positive thou shalt commandment, women are exempt from, they might choose to be able to do those commandments to perform them and, and still receive reward for them, but, but they are not obligated to do so. I'd like to thank my guest, Rabbi Kolakowski for talking with me here today, and I shall do so now. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you for having me. Here's the thing, a lot of foods are named after places that actually have nothing to do with the origins of these foods. French fries are from Belgium. Hawaiian sweet rolls are from Portugal. Philadelphia cream cheese is from New York. The pastry we call a Danish is from Austria. And Russian dressing is from New Hampshire. German chocolate cake, however, is named properly. It was invented in the United States by Sam German. Superman. In the comic books, he can fly, is invulnerable to most damage, can shoot lasers out of his face, and can easily throw an aircraft carrier to the moon. He has these abilities thanks to his alien physiology reacting with the Earth's yellow sun, which of course means on Earth he has no superpowers. The sun is white. It looks yellow from here due to the light refracting in our atmosphere. It's the same reason why the sky is blue. So maybe Superman really does exist. His powers 
just don't work here. Comic nerds already know that my all-time favorite villain, Superboy Prime, actually does live here on Earth. Our Earth, where superheroes are merely works of fiction. Thanks for watching, and may the road rise with you.